We use energy, lots of energy. Denmark has a political objective of fossil fuel independence, and therefore our energy systems will change significantly in the coming decades. In 40 years, Denmark's energy supply should be based on renewable energy, with wind power, biomass and solar energy representing the largest resources. But where should the energy come from when the wind does not blow? What should we do with the surplus energy when wind power generation far exceeds demand? And which forms of energy should we use in places where we cannot use the power from wind, sun and biomass? The answer is integration. Integration of our energy systems. In a future based on renewable energy, the gas system can come to play a completely new role by using gas produced on the basis of such renewable energy sources as biomass, organic waste, sun and wind. Some of the most significant renewable energy forms that will replace fossil fuels in Denmark in the long term are wind, solar and wave energy, as well as biomass and biogas. Energy generation from wind, sun and waves does not follow power demand, so there is also a need for fuels for generating power when there is insufficient wind. On those days when the wind is still, the energy shortfall in Denmark will be equivalent to the output of 10 large power stations. Although this only occurs for a limited number of hours each year, naturally power should still be available in the sockets when the wind drops. In such circumstances, gas can contribute to the solution. Gas produced on the basis of renewable energy. But in the electricity-oriented society of the future, there will also be energy consumption to which electricity is not suited and which will require an easily accessible fuel, for example, for long-distance road transport and for ships and planes, as well as an array of industrial processes. This fuel could be gas-produced from renewable energy. Gas is a stable and efficient form of energy that can be flexibly produced from renewable energy sources. And as a flexible building block, Gas can be combined and converted into a variety of fuels that can supplement the power system in pace with the electrification of society. Some of these fuels are liquid, others are gaseous, and they have different properties and strengths. Methanol, ethanol, biogas, hydrogen and other gases. We already produce biogas from agricultural manure in Denmark but there are numerous other possibilities for producing green gas. The biomass that can be converted to gas is derived from various organic materials. We call it yellow, green and blue biomass. Yellow biomass primarily consists of straw and wood chips. Green biomass consists, for example, of energy willow and clover. Blue biomass comes from algae and seaweed. Some of the gas can also be produced by converting such waste as slurry from agriculture and organic waste from industry and households. Biomass and waste are converted to gas in several ways. Biogas is formed from organic materials in large containers without oxygen. These organic materials include slurry, wastewater or waste which decompose biologically. The other method is thermal biogas production. This method utilizes such materials as straw, wood chips, wood pellets or seaweed. The third method involves the fermentation of biomass to the biofuel ethanol. The residual products in the process can be used for thermal gasification or for classic biogas production by oxygen-free gasification. The gas from the processes can be collected in gas storage facilities and later upgraded and transported through the internationally connected natural gas network. The production processes, especially thermal biogas production, develop heat. This can be collected and distributed through the district heating network, thereby fully utilizing the energy. When wind is abundant and wind power generation exceeds demand, the price of power falls. This cheaper power can, via electrolysis, be used for producing gas. In that way, wind power can be converted into gas in the future and stored for later use. 
With the assistance of a range of technologies and processes, the energy from wind power, biomass and waste can thus be stored in large volumes in the existing gas network. At the same time, gas is cheap to transport and easy to store. In Denmark, we have gas storage facilities capable of covering one quarter of our annual gas consumption. This is clearly an advantage when distributing and consuming the gas. With gas as an energy carrier, wind and biomass could be utilized throughout the entire Danish energy system. For power generation, for biofuels in the transport sector, and as upgraded biogas for, among others, CHP generation or transported to the internationally connected gas network. In 40 years, Denmark's energy supply should be converted to renewable energy. A gas system utilizing gas based on renewable energy can constitute a significant contribution to the conversion towards a sustainable society to the benefit of people the economy and the environment. To learn more, watch the full version on energynet.dk. We're just uh, organizing a couple extra chairs so those who are standing don't need to. We, we seem to have found the right topic. We've uh, got a full house today and then some. Uh, my name's Mark Winfield. I'm co-chair of the Sustainable Energy Initiative at York University. And I want to invite Sean Conway to uh, open the session formally on behalf of Ryerson University. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and ladies and gentlemen. My goodness, I've known Mark a long time and he's uh, getting to look very uh, authoritative. Not that he didn't always sound authoritative. Uh, then Richard Laszlo is looking like a young banker here today. So uh, I guess it's uh, Paul, uh, Peter Love having a, a very salutary effect on some of these uh, bright, an excellent presentation, by the way. And I'm going to come back to that in a very, very brief moment. On behalf of my colleague and boss, Dr. Dan McGilvery, the academic director of the Ryerson Center for, actually the executive director of the uh, Ryerson Center for Urban Energy, who unfortunately could not be here today, I am uh, happy to convey his greetings and the welcome of, of, of the Ryerson Center for uh, Urban Energy. Uh, delighted uh, to have you here on a very, very timely subject. Um, I um, just want to say, uh, and my, I'm a a visiting fellow at the uh, at the Ryerson Center, as is my colleague Jim McDougall, who's probably better known uh, to all of you. Um, so we're delighted to have you here, and I'm I'm not kidding. I, this topic is probably even more timely uh, than you understand. I don't know how many of you have read, but if you have not read uh, the just released Francis Fung uh, TD Economics uh, Return to the Core, have any of you read that in the last couple of days? Um, read that. And if 15 or 20 percent of that's true, and most of it looks like it's true, uh, then uh, this is, as we used to say in the old parliamentary world, a matter of urgent and pressing necessity. Uh, there is an enormous change going on in particularly the Toronto core. It's very clear that we're not going to do or be able to do some of the stuff we used to do, Peter. Um, and so um, the idea of integrating systems and grids we've already got to take advantage of the efficiencies and the opportunities seems to me to be uh, self-evident. With one or two caveats, and I was just going to make this point to you, Mark, I don't know how you could do this, but some of you have heard me rant about this, uh, poor Richard and others at, uh, and Fernando. The problem with that film is that the vast public 
and quite frankly, 70 to 80 percent of the decision makers will be shocked in a positive way to see that. So the College of Cardinals knows this stuff. <laughs> Mostly the people in the pews don't. And that's not to say they won't be very interested in and impressed and encouraged by. But one of the things I learned in a previous life, um, you've got to uh, make sure that people know what it is you're trying to do, how it works, and why it would be a good thing for them. And I think there's a very, very good message here. My concern continues to be an awful lot of very interested people in the pews of the theoretical church don't really know what it is you're talking about. And when they find out, I think they will be both interested in and supportive of the good work that you're here to continue today. And without further ado, I looked at this panel and this uh, program, see a lot of people I know, and they're all much more knowledgeable and have much more constructive and uh, interesting things to say. So again, on behalf of Ryerson, delighted to see you here, and I look forward to a very productive session. Mark? And I'd uh, like to invite my Dean, Noel Sturgeon, to make some uh, uh, welcoming remarks on behalf of the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned I'm the new Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies, and I really appreciate um, being here, which I agree is a very, very important uh, group uh, to talk about very important issues. I want to thank the uh, Sustainable Energy in Initiative, in particular Tanya Roberts, who does a lot of the organizing for these uh, kinds of events, and Ryerson's Center for Urban Energy, which I'm interested in learning more about and talking more um, with them about partnerships we can have between SEI and CUE. Uh, community energy planning may seem, by definition, a parochial and somewhat narrow concern, but community energy plans are essential in two ways. First, as this audience well knows, we are, feel we are facing enormous challenges as an increasing carbon load produces more volatile weather, rising seas, and resulting millions of people moving. Whether you call them climate refugees or climate migrants, with the likelihood of increasing conflicts over resources such as water, we are going to have an incredible amount of people moving around, and um, there will be uh, lots of disruptions in various communities because of that. We are all, especially those of us in wealthier nations, obligated to address our energy dependence on carbon fuels. And it is clearer and clearer that this must be addressed locally and regionally as international and national efforts have stalled, more or less. Gord Miller, in a recent presentation at SEI, the Environmental Commissioner, recently said that, um, that while the U.S. consistently imposed the Kyoto Treaty really from the beginning, it is likely to exceed those goals because the states have um, inv involved themselves in initiatives around energy planning. And he said that um, Canada is not really in the same position as of yet. So local and regional planning is crucial right now. The second reason why community energy plans are important is not simply to reduce our dependence on carbon fuels, um, but to increase community resilience in the face of the social upheavals and energy challenges that face us. Regardless if we switch to an entirely renewable energy base tomorrow, um, we would need to have a base of interrelationships and discussions among communities to be able to move forward. Uh, recent research has shown um, in, re in response to what's uh, Hurricane Sandy and other recent kinds of uh, volatile weather that communities that survived those disasters were communities that knew each other that had been involved in planning together on a variety of things, some of them surprising, like in New York there was a surfing club that actually held together a community after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and who would think that, you know, surfers would be, and in New York, surfers, I don't know. But that, this research showed that. So it's really important that um, we involve ourselves in community energy plans that involve multiple stakeholders that pay attention to inequalities in communities and bring people in who have a variety of point of views um, and engage all members of the communities in the kind of educational process that Sean is talking about that we really need to happen. So that's why it's so important to bring together, as we have here, university, governmental, industry, and community leaders to discuss this issue. So I look forward very much to hearing from the, our panelists. Thank you very much. Thanks, Noel. Um, 
from the perspective of uh, the Sustainable Energy Initiative um, at York University, and the initiative is, is a, an effort on our part to bring together the streams of research and teaching and partnership, uh, which were already emerging within the faculty and in partnership with, with uh, non-governmental organizations, municipalities, local distribution companies, around sustainable energy, and in particular around renewable energy, conservation, demand management, um, <clears throat> and district energy systems. And for us, the engagement around community energy planning, in particular, has been, has been a very um, kind of bottom-up experience in the sense that we have a large land use planning program as part, as part of our master's program at the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And my colleague and I, uh, Jose Echeverri and myself, um, found ourselves very shortly after our arrival at FES, um, presented with a, a parade of planning students in our offices who were looking for frameworks to tie together land use planning, transportation, urban form, climate change, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and for whom they could find within the planning world no framework within which to do that. And we realized very quickly that community energy planning was that framework. That is, that is where we try and bring all of these elements together and operationalize them. And in that context, we've, we've, we've uh, set this seminar in motion. Uh, there is, in fact, a part two on uh, February 11th. This, this session is focused on the policy dimensions of the state of community energy planning in Ontario, both in terms of what is happening at the municipal level, in terms of municipally-led initiatives, and also how that is, that is interacting with the provincial policy frameworks around land use planning and energy. Uh, we've brought Alex Boston from British Columbia to give us some perspective outside of Ontario as well. Uh, where there, the, the conversation in some ways, partially as a result of provincial legislation, has evolved forward somewhat more. But in the research that we've been having students doing, uh, we've come very quickly to the realization that Ontario and British Columbia really are the focal points of activity around this. Ontario, we are, we are particularly more bottom-up. This is a very definitely municipally-led initiative where the province is now needing to try and catch up. But it also seemed to me <clears throat> um, this session is, is especially timely in light of the events of, of uh, the weekend and the fact that we have a new premier designate. And it, it struck me that, that as, as Sean was suggesting, some of this maybe is, is moving into uh, the larger political conversation when uh, one of the, the competitors for the leadership, uh, Glenn Murray, in fact, uh, he, he dropped out relatively early and, and uh, through his support behind uh, Kathleen Wynne, um, I, was, I was shocked a couple of weeks ago to turn on Focus Ontario at 7 o'clock Sunday morning, which if you're, you, you have to be an Ontario political geek to, 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 be, to be that keen. And, and there was, was Mr. Murray, one of the candidates for the premiership of this province, sitting there talking about community energy planning. I thought, well, they, we, 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 we seem to be moving the boundaries of the conversation in some interesting ways, and, and it, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up playing some significant role in the new government, which will have to be formed before the legislature resumes. So, so this is a very, very timely conversation in terms of potential connections with discussions which are going to start to unfold at the provincial level uh, around energy policy, around transportation policy, and around land use planning. <clears throat>